All right, uh, why don't we go ahead and get started. So welcome back everyone from Thanksgiving weekend. Um, hope you guys had a good time. And just a couple things before we start today. So on Wednesday, I'll have my last lecture. We'll be talk talking about allograft rejection. And then on Friday, Dr. Freeman and I will have a review session. So if you guys have any questions uh, for us, certainly you can, you can join us then. I'll also be having my, my standard office hours on Wednesday at two o'clock in my office. And if you can't make it to that, just send me an email and we'll try to arrange another time uh, to meet. Now, keep in mind that next week, uh, at I think it's one o'clock, we're, we're meeting here for the final. So uh, time is short. So if you have any questions or anything like that, try to show up at office hours or send an email or use the, um, the message board on, uh, online. I haven't gotten a lot of responses yet, so I'm assuming that activity will start to increase over there over the next week or so. So please take advantage of those resources and um, yeah, okay. So today we're gonna be finishing our discussion about autoimmune diseases and then we'll, um, we'll talk about vaccines, which we've already spent a little bit of time talking about, uh, but we'll kind of get into some, some of the details about how these vaccines work. And specifically with respect to autoimmunity, um, one of the comments that I'd made last time was this, this idea that there are various factors that lead to autoimmune susceptibility, a lot of which we don't know, but we do know that there are genetic factors, and we spent some time the last time talking about um, one particular genetic factor linked to, to a locus that you guys are all familiar with. Does anybody remember what that was? Particular genetic loci or locus? A little too much turkey, huh? So MHC, right? We talked about MHC and how certain alleles of MHC make it more susceptible to uh, certain autoimmune diseases. And the reason for that is that certain peptides that may be you know, provoking an autoimmune response might be presented better uh, by certain classes of MHC or certain alleles of, of MHC than others. So that's part of the sort of the genetic components. And so today we'll be talking about some of the environmental factors and in particular, the infectious agents that can then uh, trigger autoimmunity. And that brings up concepts of uh, something that we sort of talked about last time, which has to do with co-stimulation, this idea that the immune system, the innate immune system needs to cooperate with the adaptive immune system in order to set up an effective uh, autoimmune response. And that requires co-stimulation, professional antigen presenting cells, uh, but also something called molecular mimicry, which we haven't really talked about much yet. So I'm gonna first talk about that. And then this concept of epitope spreading, in particular in the, in the context of lupus, where uh, that seems to take place. The idea that uh, an autoimmune response may start off with only maybe one or two antigens, but then over time you start to, to have this um, spread and a much more widening autoimmune response. And we'll talk about a couple of animal models for autoimmune disease. And then we'll switch over to talking about vaccination and we'll start out talking about some work by this physician, Edward Jenner, uh, where he uh, developed an approach to deal with smallpox infection, as well as cer certain features of effective vaccines, uh, vaccination against viruses, bacterial vaccines, and then we'll, we'll finish up with the discussion of conjugate vaccines and how you can overcome certain limitations of, of um, some of these vaccines. All right, so the f talking about autoimmunity, um, one of the points that I wanted to make was that uh, with infection by microbes, it's often seen that this, this seems to be associated with certain autoimmune diseases, and examples of that include MS and type 1 diabetes. Um, and the point of this is that um, you can trigger certain types of autoimmune diseases as a result of infection, partly because this can essentially provide this inflammatory environment. And so the result is that that releases the immune system from a resting state. You may have circulating autoreactive T cells as a result of incomplete uh, central tolerance, so you don't get all of those autoreactive cells uh, deleted in the thymus. Part of the reason for that, again, is that you need to have a certain threshold in order you know, for those cells to get deleted during negative selection. And if you don't have enough signal coming through the T cell receptor, um, even though it might be autoreactive, there's not enough signal. So it's kind of a weakly avid interaction with, with peptide and MHC that thymocyte will survive. And so that then becomes part of your peripheral T cell repertoire. And as I said the last time, all of us have autoreactive T cells in our bodies. All of us don't have an autoimmune disease. And the reason for that is that most of these cells are, are what we call ignorant. They're really just not getting activated because they're not overtly autoreactive. However, under the right state, 
For example, if you have uh, increased co-stimulation, uh, increased inflammatory cytokines, the result is that that may kind of provoke the, these, these ignorant T cells to become activated. So now you have some uh, co-stimulatory signals that are coming along, you have the appropriate cytokines, and that can then cause those, those autoreactive T cells to become uh, activated and they can start to cause problems. A second type of example where, where microbial infection can provoke an autoimmune response is what is called molecular mimicry. And I'll show you an example with rheumatic fever, although there are various uh, uh, microbes that can induce this, some of which induce a, a humoral response, so you get an autoreactive antibodies, and some of these can then provoke uh, a T cell response. So one example of this um, is with this bug called Streptococcus pyrogenes, which happens to, to uh, induce particular disease. But what's interesting about this particular bug is that it can generate these cross-reactive antibodies, as I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and this particular kind of response, those cross-reactive antibodies can impact the heart, joints, and kidneys, and in some cases it can induce heart failure and death. So it's, it's obviously a problem, but it's only transient because it's primarily a B cell response. So it's primarily an antibody response, and you don't have a, a lot of T cells, and so the result of that is that it's transient. But we still consider it an, an autoimmune response. So, so this is this idea of molecular mimicry. It's basically where there's some sort of cross-reactivity, there's some re resemblance between an antigen that's inside of the microbe itself and some antigen within us, some, some host tissue antigen. An example of this is with this rheumatic fever, which is induced by uh, this streptococcus pyrogenes, pyogenes, I should say. And an example of that is shown here. So, so here, let's say you have this bacteria that comes into the body, you start to generate these antibodies that can recognize certain surface uh, antigens on the surface of this bacteria, and you make a lot of these antibodies. The problem is that some of those antibodies will make their way through the circulation into the heart where there are cross-reactive epitopes. So the point of this is that you know, some of these bacterial antigens on the surface have enough physical similarity with these antigens that are expressed uh, within the heart on some of these epithelial cells that you can then start to get damage. And so then this, this because this will fix complement, you now start to damage the heart tissue and that can then uh, lead to some serious damage. So that's one example with these uh, bacterial um, diseases that can induce rheumatic fever. Um, other examples that are more T cell dependent, so the association with, with HLA is known, and examples of these include uh, chlamydia, which can induce uh, this Reiter syndrome, which is kind of an arthritis, um, Shigella, Salmonella, uh, Yersinia, et cetera, that have this uh, certain peptides that are cross-reactive and are presented very efficiently by HLA B27 that can also induce arthritis. Uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, which can induce um, uh, Lyme disease, and in particular chronic arthritis and Lyme disease associated with these alleles and Coxsackie um, echoviruses and rubella viruses that can then induce type 1 diabetes through association of some of these, these molecular, these sort of cross-reactive antigens on these uh, MHC molecules. All right, so how does this work with, with T cells? It's pretty straightforward with B cells. You just have something that looks roughly similar um, in three-dimensional space, but of course T cells really don't see three-dimensional space, they see these linear peptides presented by MHC. So let's say if you, if you looked at these peptides, um, and again, these are relatively short peptides, maybe about you know, eight to 10 amino acids for class one, maybe 10 to 15 amino acids for class two, but regardless, they're pretty small. So they, and they have to fit, at least half of those residues are pointing down, um, uh, the side chains are pointing down into the MHC, so there's really not a lot of information that the T cell receptor sees. And the point of that is that, you know, if you get binding, so let's say that this is a pathogenic peptide, binds to MHC, and then um, there's enough similarity with one of these self-peptides that the self-peptide actually kind of looks like it physically, then a T cell can then become activated against it. So an example of this, so these are essentially cross-reactive epitopes. So let's say that you have a bacterial infection by this particular uh, bug. That results in, in a primary response. You activate some naive T cells by presentation of that antigen on MHC, and those cells then get activated. Uh, the problem comes now that you have effector cells. So these effector cells, which have been uh, 
converted, they've differentiated from naive cells, they've undergone clonal expansion and, and so forth. Now those cells are obviously going to try to fight off this bacteria, but because of that cross-reactivity, they have the capacity to now start to attack some self-tissue. And in this case, say a macrophage has picked up some of the self-antigen, and the result of that then is that um, you're going to get you know, some damage to that particular tissue. You might generate a bunch of inflammatory cytokines because this is a, let's say, a Th1 cell, and the consequence then is, is you're going to have an autoimmune disease, okay? One other point that I wanted to make, and I, and I sort of alluded to this when I was talking about negative selection, because of the fact that, that these T cells are sort of weakly autoreactive, they're normally not a problem. But because of the fact that, you know, you have a, a pathogen here that's kind of basically activated the whole innate response, now that is, you know, that's um, kind of raised the level of activation. On top of that, because of the fact that these cells are no longer naive, they don't require co-stimulation at this point. So once you've gained this, uh, this pool of T cells that are reactive against this bacterial antigen, because of this cross-reactive peptide that's, that's self-derived, now you have the potential for generating an autoimmune response. Okay, any questions about that concept? Yeah. For, for their initial stimulation, that's correct. So you don't need the co-stimulation for the cell when they're already... No, I mean, it has, co-stimulation on an activated, like an effector cell is more about kind of maintaining the survival of the cells than it is the, about the initial uh, stimulation. Any other questions? All right. So another thing that happens with um, infection, whether it's a virus or a fungus or, or a bacteria, is that you know you get this these inflammatory cytokines and one of those uh, inflammatory cytokines is interferon gamma and in this case here we're, we're looking at um, thyroid epithelial cells we talked about thyroid before in the context of, of graves disease but um, you know one of the things that can happen is on these non-professional antigen presenting cells like this this thyroid epithelial cell they have receptors for interferon gamma and so the consequence of, of binding to interferon gamma is that these cells that are not professional antigen presenting cells can now start to upregulate MHC class two on the surface. So when we think about uh, professional antigen presenting cell, we're usually talking about a cell where you, you have class two expression, you can have co-stimulatory um, ligand expression and so forth. In this case here, because of the fact that we've already activated this, this class of T cells that's against this, this cross-reactive antigen, um, and now we have a, a whole bunch of these, these Th1 cells, let's say. Now because of the fact that there's, there's HLA class two expression on the surface of non-professional antigen presenting cells, those cells are now capable of activating these T cells, these effector T cells. And so the consequence of this is that you get more expression of interferon gamma because these are, these are Th1 cells, other inflammatory cytokines, TNF, and you start to recruit in um, other T cells, you start to recruit in macrophages, other inflammatory cells, and so then the whole process of, of autoimmune destruction can start to take place. And so this can, can then not only lead to the generation of, of a humoral response, but more importantly, this can actually lead to an inflammatory response where you can then start to damage that tissue. Okay, any questions about that? All right. So I wanted to talk about a couple of, of animal models for uh, this because these are these are things that we you know we're trying to understand a lot more about how autoimmunity works and um, one of the ways that we can do that is to use certain animal models so one of the one example of this is what's called experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis or EAE so this is basically a model for multiple sclerosis and in MS you have T cells that become activated by these myelin uh, producing cells okay so myelin is is normally there to unsheathe our nerves in the CNS, and it allows for rapid nerve conduction. If you have T cells going into the brain, normally they don't get there because they don't get past the, this, what's called a blood-brain barrier. So normally, uh, the, the brain and the central nervous system is considered in what we call an immunologically privileged site. However, if, if bad things happen, if you do have some sort of an inflammatory response, the T cells will pass that blood-brain barrier. And that's basically this EAE um, model. So, so basically what happens is you take a mouse, and you inject that mouse with um, myelin proteins. In, in this case here, they're using myelin basic protein, which is one of the components of myelin. Uh, and you put it in the context of something called an adjuvant, which is basically 
In this case, they're using complete Freund's adjuvant, which is basically a, a mixture of dead bacteria, other parts uh, that if you inject it along with an antigen, the adjuvant activates the innate immune system. So even though you don't need an infection there, because of the fact that you're injecting them with these, these PAMPs, a whole bunch of these PAMPs, that'll activate the innate immune response. And then uh, because you're putting in this, this myelin basic protein, now you're, you're essentially putting a bunch of this, this uh, myelin antigen into this response. And so the result of that is that you start to generate a bunch of, of T cells uh, they say Th1 cells here, we also know that there's another type of inflammatory cell called the Th17 cell, which they call it that because it produces interleukin-17. But, but regardless, these Th1 and Th17 cells are myelin reactive, so they're specific for myelin basic protein. They go into the CNS, into the brain and into the spinal cord and start to attack the cells that produce that myelin. And so the result of that is that these mice then start to develop paralysis because they can't, they don't have, you know, very efficient nerve conduction. Now you can mimic this disease. If you take T cells out of this mouse that has paralysis and you adoptively transfer those into a naive mouse, that mouse will also develop paralysis. And the reason for that, and this is called a, a passive transfer of the disease. The reason, that basically proves that uh, the T cells that are being, indu being induced by this, um, injection of this uh, myelin antigen along with CFA, that then, because it can then transfer the disease, we know that it's the T cells that are promoting this particular type of autoimmune disease. Okay. Any questions about EAE? Yeah. So, so the question is, if there was no adjuvant added, would you get a T cell response? And, and the answer is no. So if you don't have an adjuvant there, um, there's not enough to provoke um, the immune response that you would get, if anything, a very, very weak EAE response. Any other questions? So another model for, for um, uh, autoimmune disease in mice is uh, for type 1 diabetes. So remember, type 1 diabetes is mediated by T cells that are reactive against these um, cells in the pancreas and these little islets of Langerhans that produce insulin called the beta cells. And so, um, so this is a model here that kind of tests this molecular mimicry theory. And basically the idea is uh, to make a transgenic mouse. So again, a, a transgenic mouse is a mouse where a piece of DNA is popped into the, um, into the germline basically of that mouse as an embryo. And then as that mouse develops, uh, it's, it carries this, this piece of DNA, this extra piece of DNA that uh, in this case has a rat insulin promoter and then it has something called a nucleoprotein from this virus called lymph lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus, or LCMV. So, so this is just sort of a, a standard mouse virus that's um, used all the time in laboratories. But the idea here is that you want to put this insulin promoter on this nucleoprotein sequence, and the idea is that um, now you start, because this rat insulin promoter is only active inside of these beta cells, you're now gonna to start to get this virus protein expressed in, in pancreas, in these beta cells. So you make this mouse, um, you can show that it has expression of this nucleoprotein even in the absence of infection, so that and it's all inside of the pancreas in these beta cells. So under these conditions, that's not sufficient to provoke a T cell response because um, you know, there's really not gonna be any sort of T cell immunity there and, and there's no uh, innate immune activation because we don't have a viral infection. But if you take those mice and then you infect them with LCMV, so these are these transgenic mice, they're expressing this viral protein inside of the pancreas. Now you infect them with, MH, with this uh, LCMV. Now what you see is that you, you start to get T cells that are activated against that nucleoprotein. They make their way inside of the pancreas and then they start to attack uh, these beta cells. And so basically what this shows is that, you know, in the context of a viral infection, in, in the context of a microbial infection, an antigen that normally wouldn't have provoked an autoimmune response now leads to this, um, uh, you know, this increase in T cells that are autoreactive against this NP protein and then uh, attack and then give rise to this diabetes. So it's kind of a mimic. It's not, I, I shouldn't say that there, it's an autoreactive antigen in this case because it's actually a, it's a viral antigen. But nevertheless, it kind of promotes or it sort of, uh, upholds this idea that you need to have some uh, underlying infection going on in order to break tolerance and then give rise to that, that kind of an um, autoimmune response.
Okay, any question about this uh, model? All right. So one of the other concepts, so, so we talked about, you know, uh, some of these different enviral, th these different environmental factors. And one of the other uh, points that I made was that sometimes you can have something called epitope spreading, which is this idea that um, when you have an autoimmune disease, sometimes it can be initiated by a single antigen and that that antigen alone is sufficient to give rise to all the, the problems that are associated with it. That's not always the case. And oftentimes um, there is what's called epitope spreading where, where the, the number of epitopes, these self-epitopes starts to increase over time as the disease spreads and makes the d disease uh, much worse over time. And this is typically the case when there is uh, collaboration between T cells and B cells. So you may have some autoantibodies there uh, that, that require the help of T cells. So the B cells that are making those autoantibodies require T cell help. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that with respect to, um, to SLE in a minute. This also can happen uh, in other cases and examples of this are with multiple sclerosis. Um, and, and this can then result in, because of the disruption that the initial uh, immune response, this autoimmune response has, you start to then uh, get a lot of tissue damage and you get release of certain uh, epitopes that are not normally seen. We call those cryptic epitopes because they're normally kind of, of you know, the immune system doesn't really see them very much. And so the, the result of a lot of this damage is that you now have these cryptic epitopes revealed which can then uh, provoke essentially a new autoimmune response while this other autoimmune response is taking place. And so this can then lead to this sort of epitope spreading. So, so the two examples that I, or the, the one example that I want to give is with SLE, with this lupus, where you have T cells that are specific for a particular self peptide that can then uh, stimulate B cell specific for DNA. Okay, and obviously DNA is not going to be presented by MHC, so it's not going to activate a T cell response. But the key to this is that there are, uh, there are complexes. Okay, and these complexes are essentially coming from cells that are dying off. So when a cell dies, uh, apoptotically, normally it's engulfed. There are macrophages and other phagocytic cells that can chew those guys, you know, basically kill those cells, chew them up, get rid of them, and keep them from being presented to the immune system. But sometimes, um, you know, there might be a defect in, in the complement system, so you don't get rid of some of these, cell, these, um, uh, these dying cells or, or whatever. You get the release of, of chromatin, and chromatin is one example where you have obviously nucleic acids, so you've got some DNA here. Uh, this is a histone or a nucleosome, so it's made up of a bunch of these histone proteins uh, and, and other binding factors associated with the chromatin. So if that chromatin is then exposed uh, outside of the cell, there might be, in this case, here's a B cell that's specific for histone one, histone H1, okay? And so the consequence then is that that B cell will take up that complex, start to process that, um, and then present some of those antigens to T cells. And in this case here, we have a, a T cell, which is specific for this histone H1 peptide. And so the consequence is just, you know, standard T cell help, like you guys have seen many, many times in the past. However, this epitope spreading can take place here where we have this single uh, CD4 T cell specific for H1 because of the fact that these B cells are taking up this complex, which is not just H1, but all of these other histones and DNA itself, you can now, this single T cell can now provide help not just to the H1 specific B cells to make H1 antibodies, but also against DNA specific B cells because the antibody molecule itself can bind to um, not just to peptides to ribosome specific B cells, to histone H2, et cetera. And so the consequence of this is that over time, uh, where you may only have a single T cell, and of course you need this T cell help for high affinity autoantibodies, right, and, and for the appropriate class switch. But if you have this single T cell, that can then provide help to all of these different B cells with these different specificities because of the fact that this is all a complex, because of the fact that it can, that this B cell can bind to that um, piece of chromatin, take it up, and then process all these different components and present those to T cells. So we can kind of flip that the other way and see how this is true also for, for a single B cell activating a variety of T cells. Again, the B cell takes up, um, you know, through its H1 specific receptor, so it binds to histone H1 on this, this chromatin, takes that up and then processes that complex into various peptides and pre presents those on, on the surface in the, in the context of class two, 
And in, in this case here, you know, you have a um, presentation of this H1 peptide that'll activate an H1 specific T cell, but you can also get presentation uh, in this case of this little piece of histone H2 that's been processed, that'll activate an H2 specific T cell, et cetera. And so, so this, this sort of uh, epitope spreading is happening both on the T cell side as well as the B cell side. And you can see how then this can then lead to uh, a significant broadening of the response and ultimately um, how, how the disease can get worse is because of the fact that now more and more antigens are being detected by these, um, by these T cells. All right, any, any questions about this concept of epitope spreading or autoimmunity before we move on to vaccines? All right. So we've talked a bit about vaccination in the past, um, and I want to kind of step back a little bit in terms of how this was really discovered, what, what actually, um, you know, what led to the discovery of, of these vac vaccines. You know, we always think of like Salk in the polio vaccine, right? But in fact, it goes way, way back in history. And one example of this is with smallpox, which is essentially eradicated in modern times, but it was a real problem uh, in the past. And this particular virus in the 20th century alone killed something like 300 million people. So it's obviously a pretty serious, uh, pretty serious threat. And it's basically been all but eradicated from the hum human population because of vaccination. Okay, not just because, you know, we didn't like it and we decided to have a campaign against it. We had a campaign to get people vaccinated and that vaccination is what got rid of this, um, this virus. Um, and, and one of the points of, that I want to make about this is that uh, with re-exposure to smallpox, people can then develop resistance to reinfection. So that implies that there's some sort of memory, there's some kind of a an immune response that's taken place, and the result of that is that if you get reinfected, you're essentially protected because of the fact that you've got these memory cells. And we talked about that, that concept before that, you know, because when you have a T cell response, you get this clonal expansion, some of the cells differentiate into these memory cells, and that's true for both B cells and T cells. Some of the effector cells then, most of them die off, but some of those can also convert into these memory cells and then are involved in a secondary response. So the purpose of vaccination is to generate essentially these memory T cells, memory B cells, and antibodies that can then give us protection if we're uh, re-exposed to that particular, um, particular virus or, or bacteria. And uh, part of the discovery of vaccination kind of goes way back, as I mentioned, uh, and involves something called variolation, which is basically taking the scabs from a smallpox patient and then drying those and then either inhaling those or rubbing those into some sort of a, a sore on your skin. And the point of that is then you're basically taking pieces of, of dead or dying virus, putting that into your system and allowing your immune system to respond to it without actually getting seriously infected. Okay, so the point of vaccination is to basically trick the immune system into thinking that it's, it's having a, a primary exposure. So an example of this, um, this, you know, going way back into the Song Dynasty of China, somewhere between 960 and 1280, um, that, that people, they were basically doing the same sort of thing where they were taking um, some of these scabs and then inoculating people with those scabs. And what's interesting is that, you know, during the American Revolutionary War, uh, George Washington was so concerned that the British might use this as a bioterror weapon that they um, had the entire Continental Army variolated. So they took these scabs uh, and then basically immunized or, or vaccinated all of the people in, the, in this, this army. So then this fellow by the name of Edward Jenner came along and, and this is kind of the important point, right? Because if you think about it, if you're taking these scabs, and, and basically they're just chock full of this virus, right? It's this live infectious virus. They're not doing anything in particular to eliminate it. So there's probably a lot of people that are getting pretty messed up. Maybe a lot of people are getting vaccinated, but there's also, you know, a number of people that are developing smallpox and probably dying as a result of that. So, you know, this is probably not the best thing. So, so along comes Jenner and he says, well, wait a second. Uh, you know, I noticed that, that if I go out in, and I look at the cow maids, which I'm assuming are people that you know, squeeze milk out of cows, um, they, they don't have any of these problems with smallpox. They have perfect skin. They, they don't look like they've ever had an issue with that. And so then he theorized, and this is way before we knew about you know, how to sequence DNA or anything like that. 
uh, b before we had electron microscopes. But he basically theorized that there must be something similar between the, the, this pox virus that infects cows and um, you know, smallpox that infects humans. And basically the idea is that these, these uh, cow maids are in fact being exposed to this, this cow pox virus and that's giving them sort of an immunity. In a sense, they're being vaccinated by um, you know, squeezing cow milk out. And so he, he really wanted to test this idea uh, basically by taking, you know, doing this sort of variolation where he took these, these dried scabs from, from cows and then using that to, uh, to vaccinate people. And that resulted in this protection from this, this smallpox virus. So that suggests then that there's, there's gotta be some sort of, of cross reactivity uh, that the immune system can recognize. And that's basically shown here. So if you have cowpox virus, um, this has some shared antigens with, uh, with smallpox. And so if, if you look here at the sort of schematic for cowpox, versus smallpox, clearly there are some antigens that are distinct, like these, uh, these little guys here, but uh, there are also some shared epitopes, some shared antigens that can provoke an immune response in people. So if you take a person and you infect that person with cowpox, either because you made them you know, go make some milk or, uh, or because you did what Jenner did, the result of that is that you're now generating these, these antibodies against these shared epitopes. And so those shared epitopes present on smallpox can now be um, recognized by these cowpox specific antibodies. And this gives you then essentially um, protection against smallpox, okay? So, this, so the, the whole point here is basically use a, a different um, virus or a different microbe that has enough cross reactivity. It can basically generate a cross reactive response that will give you protection, okay? But the problem, of course, is that there's, there's not a lot of examples of that out there. So this is only protective for this one particular instance. There's a lot of things that you know, can make us sick that we need to be protected against where we don't have this sort of natural uh, variant, which is, you know, importantly, is not gonna kill us or make us really sick. So let's think about vaccination and uh, you know, what you might wanna consider to be important. Number one is the, the type of infection, whether it's extracellular, where you might wanna have, say, an antibody response uh, versus an intracellular sort of pathogen where you might wanna have more of a T cell response that can then uh, bring to bear its effector mechanisms. And you wanna have good protection at the site of entry, and an example of this would be you know, mucosal protection for, for example, with flu bugs. Uh, it's gotta be safe, and the public has to be con convinced of its safety. Now this is obviously, this is a huge issue right now because there's a lot of people out there that, you know, people that are, one would think, intelligent, you know, from, and I'm gonna get on, I'm gonna get on my little soapbox here because there's a lot of really smart people in, you know, surrounding areas here like Newport Beach, even the ones that didn't show up on the TV show, and they won't get their kids vaccinated. And, and why do they not do that? Does anybody know? What, 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 did, what, what did they say is their rationale for not having their child vaccinated? They're concerned about autism. Okay, so uh, what is the proof for, for this connection between vaccination and autism? Now, I'm not saying the vaccines are perfectly safe, but yeah, you have an answer to that? There was a paper published in the Yeah, there was a paper published by a British physician it, some, sometime in the 90s that said, made this link between autism and um, vaccination. Does anybody know the veracity, can anybody say anything about the veracity of that particular paper? Yeah. Completely bogus, okay? So this guy has now developed this, this question, and I, you will see that in the YouTube uh, in a second here, that, that you know, vaccines might cause your kids to have some problem, you know, what, like autism or you know, who, who knows what else. But you know, is there any scientific basis for that? I, all, all I can say as a scientist is, you know, to prove a no, to prove a negative is, is nearly impossible. So I can't say it's not. However, the proof is certainly not there to, to link it. Yeah. What wasn't he on the take for from a vaccine company? Oh, yeah, see, I don't know all the details of that. I mean, it's possible that, that people are conflicted. I mean, you could say that about me, right? I'm up here, I'm an immunologist, you know, I'm telling you, you know, vaccinate your kids. I vaccinated my kids, 
you know, they're, they're a little weird, but overall they're okay. <laughs> so, you know, the, neither of them has autism. I mean, I, you know, it's horrible. I, I obviously feel bad for people because when you're a parent, you know, you're worried about everything, right? But, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's really sad when you have somebody that, that's supposedly knowledgeable telling other supposedly knowledgeable people about these evils when they don't exist or we don't know. And maybe they have some sort of, you know, some conflict by that. All right, so I'm gonna get off my soapbox now. I'll get back on it later. All right, so obviously you wanna have it safe and you wanna have limited uh, or, or, you know, no serious side effects. So one example of this is against pertussis. Bordadella pertussis is the bacterial pathogen and this causes whooping cough, which I don't know if you guys have ever heard you know, these kids when they get it, but it's horrible. And they can get infected for months. Um, and in the turn of the, the last century, this pertussis killed about half, this 0.5% of, of kids here in the US. Um, and then in the 40s, there was a vaccine that was developed and this used killed whole cells. And that resulted in the, the death rate going from 0.5% to 0.002. So pretty effective vaccine. But the problems was that you know, associated with this, uh, various, you know, issues about brain damage and death, um, you know, so there were some serious s concerns about this. And so obviously you're giving something to somebody who's healthy. They start off as perfectly healthy. Um, you wanna make sure that this is not gonna cause any harm, right? I mean, all, a lot of you guys are gonna go off to medical school and the first thing is, you know, do no harm. Well, you're putting a vaccine, which you know is gonna prov provoke an immune response. And in some cases, it's like an attenuated, uh, strain of virus or a virus that's been grown in other cells. You gotta be really careful. You gotta make sure that this is not gonna lead to any sort of uh, disease. So, uh, so they've changed that up and now instead they use what are called subunit vaccines and we'll talk about what those are in a minute. All right, so the new, the new vaccine that's, that's currently in use uh, is against a, a purified toxin from uh, pertussis. And so the result of that is that you're putting in this toxin which is inactive, so it is itself not gonna cause any problems, but it's enough to provoke an immune response and um, you know, give people protection. How vaccines work. Vaccines pack big protection into itty bitty packages, and these guys mean business. Essentially, vaccines give your child's body a practice run in defending against real-world germs. There are five main ways that vaccines are made. Number one, a live but weakened form of the disease is used. Number two, an inactive form. Number three, vaccines can use only part of the disease. Number four, or just some deactivated disease toxins. And number five, some vaccines use a much less dangerous wannabe version of a virus. But no matter how it was made, all vaccines have the same strategy. They initiate the creation of protective antibodies without actually making your child sick. These antibodies are kind of like the watchmen in your child's system. They're constantly on the lookout for any bad guys or diseases. So if and when they come across one, they sound the alarm for your child's body to go on the defense and attack the germ right away. In some cases, booster shots are then used as gentle reminders for your child's body to always stay on guard. The only other way to create protective antibodies is to actually get sick. But when your child becomes infected with the disease naturally, there's no telling its strength or how it will affect them. Vaccines are a safe, controlled way to build immunity. So in the future, if the real germ ever shows up, your child's body will recognize it and keep that shield of immunity up for his or her entire life. And when they're good, we're all good. Yeah, that sort of brings up this point of what we call herd immunity. You know, if, if everybody's vaccinated, then um, you know, there's no bug there to, uh, to propagate it, to infect other kids. Um, and so, you know, that's not a great video. I tried to find some and all the shorter videos that I had out there were, were things like, you know, deep pop, I mean, all these kind of, um, well, you guys all know about YouTube. All right, a lot of cranks out there. Okay, so, so some of the features of these effective vaccines, obviously they're safe and protective. They can maintain um, this prolonged protection so they can last for several years in some cases for, the, for our lives, which is true for, um, for smallpox, can induce uh, neutralizing antibodies like for, for polo, polio, I should say, uh, 
um, and is, is capable of preventing infection, can induce a T cell response in, in other cases, and these are obviously, you know, the intracellular uh, bugs, um, and then some practical considerations that, you know, maybe we wouldn't think about, but one is that they need to be low cost per dose. So you may go into certain places in the world where, you know, they have a very high rate of infection by a certain bug, um, and, you know, it's really expensive to, to get these vaccines to them. So you need to try to make them low cost. They have to be biologically stable because they may not be, you know, it may take a while for that to get to that particular patient population. You need to have uh, ease of administration and obviously few um, side effects. All right, so how do you generate some of these? So I mentioned, you know, one way is that you have a killed or inactivated virus, which is kind of what um, the Salk polio vaccine was about. And basically, you know, taking um, Salk vaccine and irradiating it, for example, and damaging the, um, the viral DNA, and that was basically a way to make sure that, you know, if you're giving these, these perfectly healthy kids this vaccine, that it's not gonna cause polio. Um, so the advantage of this then, of course, is that you're gonna generate a, a really strong response. The, the disadvantage is that it requires a significant, um, very large population or, or preparation of virus in order to be, to be effective because you're killing off a lot of the, the bugs and some of them are, are, in this case, just not gonna be very effective at activating an immune response. And so then along came uh, folks like Sabine who developed these what are called live attenuated viruses and basically, um, in this case, and this is for measles and mumps and polio um, and yellow fever, and basically the way that this is done is by taking these bugs, in this case, so let's say here you've got a, a polio virus that you can infect human cells with, um, and then you culture this in some monkey cells. And the monkey cells are close enough to human that the, the host response or the, the uh, host range of this virus is against human, but some of, the, some of these viruses will make their way um, into these monkey cells. And then because of the fact that they're in this different strain, they start to want to become accommodated to that, that monkey cell as opposed to human cell. And so they undergo mutation. And by continuously passaging those viruses in these monkey cells, um, you start to generate a, a version of that virus that's no longer very efficient at being able to grow in human cells. And so then you can take that virus that's perfectly infectious but at this point it's attenuated. It doesn't have the ability to provoke a disease once it gets into the humans and you put that into that, into that individual by, by vaccination, then you start to generate um, a really profound response uh, against that particular bug. And, the, and part of the reason why these are so much more effective than the, um, the heat killed or inactivated viruses is because of the fact that these are, you know, they're, they're capable of infection they're also capable of activating the innate immune response because they've got all these molecular patterns um, that are associated with the virus. And so the result then is that you get a very efficient um, vaccination. So uh, a third way that you can then generate these vaccines is through what are called subunit vaccines. Um, and, you know, one way is you get these heat killed, um, or, or irradiated vaccines or viruses. One way, as I just mentioned, is to make these attenuated viruses. And then the third is by, instead of trying to take a whole virus or a uh, whole microbe and using that as your vaccine, you can take a component of that that is available to the immune system somehow. And an example of this is for hepatitis B, which has this surface antigen, which is called hep B surface antigen or HBSAG. That's something that's it's expressed on the surface of these virions. And basically, if you take this um, hep B surface antigen and then make it recombinant, so you make a big batch of this stuff by growing it up in, in bacterial cells, now you can, you can take that big batch and then use that as your vaccination. And in this case, it's not infectious. And so the consequence is that um, your vaccine will be very safe. You don't have any chance of it you know, mutating back and becoming uh, a problem. All right, so those are all viral uh, vaccines. I want to talk a little bit about bacterial vaccines. And um, basically, there are certain vaccines. Um, w one of these is against tuberculosis, and this is called this BCG or Bacille Calmette Guerin. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that properly, but BCG. And, and that's used in a lot of places, like for example, in Europe. Uh, it's not typically used in the USA. You, you can actually have your child vaccinated for this using this uh, BCG. 
but it's not really used very much in, in the USA. And part of the reason for that is that it's not particularly, it's not a particularly great um, vaccine. And then on top of that, tuberculosis has traditionally not been a big problem in, in the US, although that seems to be, um, seems to be changing in certain populations. So, uh, so, but overall, that's one way that you can do it. So again, kind of similar to what's happening with, with viruses. Um, another example is you know, using these subunit vaccines, uh, like, like for example, diphtheria and, and tetanus, where um, you basically generate uh, these, these vaccines using pieces of the toxin, but in this case, the toxin is itself inactive, and that's um, basically by, by denaturing it using formalin. And then you, you can have certain combinatorial vaccines where you can have several of these, these inactivated toxins, like the DTP vaccine, which has uh, toxins from diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. Okay. Now another example of a, of a bacterial vaccine that's not a toxin are those that, that target these um, polysaccharide capsules. And this is true for pneumococcus, uh, salmonella, meningococcus. And basically what happens is that, you know, the immune system is not particularly effective at getting, at, at dealing with these kinds of infections. And the reason for that is that this capsule, which is kind of this, this mucky mess, it's sort of like, a, you know, this polysaccharide coating uh, prevents um, fixation by complement. And so the, the bacteria are just essentially protecting themselves from recognition by complement. Now, if an antibody comes along that can bind to the capsule, uh, that can then lead to the complement fixation pathway, and then that can clear out the bug. So if you can develop a, a subunit vaccine where you have a piece of this capsule or polysaccharide, you can generate antibodies against that, that capsule. And so the result of that is that the vaccine provokes you know, these um, sort of weak uh, antibodies that can recognize the, the, this capsule and then lead to complement fixation and clearance of, of the bug. And that's, that's fine. It's not particularly effective in, in children uh, below 18 months of age. And the reason for that is that they don't have very good T-independent responses. So they don't do a very good job of generating antibodies um, without T-cells. And so to get around that problem, people use what are called conjugate vaccines. Okay, so these conjugate vaccines, we've, we've heard about before, we talked about them in this context of, of T-cell help. And basically, the example of, of, that I'll show you is one where, let's say you have one of these polysaccharides from, from the capsule that you wanna generate a, a strong antibody response to, and then you, you physically covalently link that to tetanus toxin that's um, in its own right is not particularly gonna cause any problems. And so the result of this that is that you now generate a T cell response that can then give rise to help for, for the B cells. And so you can generate a higher affinity response through this whole process of somatic hypermutation in, inside of the B cells. And that's shown in this, in this slide here where if you have a B cell um, and here's the vaccine, it has this piece of the, this polysaccharide capsule uh, linked up to this tetanus toxin, or I have it backwards. This is the, poly cap, the polysaccharide and this is the the tetanus toxin, but the point of this is that if you have a B cell comes along, recognizes the, the, the um, capsule uh, polysaccharide, this then gets taken up in the B cell, uh, the peptides from the toxin are, are then processed and presented on MHC class two, and the result of that is that you, you prime a T cell, a helper T cell that can then provide help to this B cell. And so now this B cell can then undergo the whole process of somatic hypermutation, uh, an appropriate class switch, and now you start to generate these high affinity antibodies. And so now because of this, um, you have these, um, these very strong antibodies that can recognize these, poly, uh, these capsule uh, polysaccharides. And this is similar to something that you guys have, have heard about in the past where you can induce what are called these carrier Hapton responses where by linking up uh, a particular, um, uh, you know, Hapton, which is a really small little epitope, to uh, a carrier protein, you can then generate both a T cell response and a B cell response that can give rise to these high affinity antibodies. All right, so we're gonna end there. We'll pick it up on, on Wednesday where we'll talk about um, uh, this whole process of graph rejection. Also, somebody had asked me, I'm, I'm gonna be posting today last year's final exam, so you guys can go through that and um, use that as kind of a guide to the sort of questions that we're gonna uh, we'll, we'll ask. Obviously, don't use that as your only way of preparing for the exam because um, 
Number one, we won't be providing a key for that because we don't want to just have you study for the last year's exam. We'd rather have you study for this year's exam. And, um, uh, but we'll put that on the website today so you can download that and use that. And if you have any questions about some of, some of the, the exam questions on that, you can come to the office hours or ask about it on Friday.